part two. So Kerry is a disgusting sellout who has voted for all kinds of legislation attacking our civil liberties and supporting neocon and neoliberal agendas. Chuck Hagel, on the other hand, this is uh, one piece of good news telegraphed out of the Obama administration that's not just talk. I thought Hegel could not possibly succeed, and let me tell you why. When I was working on Libya, gradually realizing from my initial view that it was great news that Gaddafi was to be overthrown, and then finding out about Libya's positive achievements and the propagandist nature of press coverage, that perhaps it was not the White House dictating the war agenda, but the media itself. Perhaps a real power in the country is the media. I still haven't sorted it all out, but I have found a lot of pieces of a puzzle. And if you look at my previous uh, reports on the media, just Google the word media on my uh, uh, YouTube channel, I go into great detail about analyzing the ownership of the media. The stock in the five big TV networks, which own many, many other forms of media, such as Hollywood Studios, radio stations, etc., are all invested by the big private equity players if I can call them that. BlackRock, State Street, Fidelity, T. Rowe Price. That is one part of the puzzle. The ultra-wealthy give their money to these giant investor investment managers. That's another part of the puzzle. Then there's the actual founders of these companies and their attitudes. These investment managers are ultra-publicity shy. And uh, Larry Fink has been called the Wizard of Oz, who is pulling all the strings and levers behind the scenes. So it would be most interesting to know how his ownership in the military contractor companies and the media companies is controlling such vast sums. What is the political uh, desires that he has? <clears throat> but the money and management of these companies is 75% or more. It concentrated in certain groups. Of course, the wealthy elite families like the Bushes, the Wasps, the white Anglo-Saxon Protestants, what they used to be called, Jewish people, neoconservatives, and the religious right. So what have they all in common? Is it defend Israel or die trying? Israel refuses to give the Palestinian citizenship. In Israel, uh, they also refuse to give them a viable country in the lands that they stole in the 1967 war. I say stole because it's morally justifiable, perhaps, to hold this land as a security buffer in retaliation for the attack on Israel. But they must allow the Palestinians to vote in an election in a sovereign state, just like every other human being in the world. The Palestinians either have to be able to vote in an election in their country of Palestine, or be granted Israeli citizenship, or at the very least be allowed to vote in Israeli elections. You cannot deny millions of people the basic right to choose their government. And it's and if you are going to do that, I am not going to spend my tax dollars defending a non-democratic country. It just infuriates me that people claim that Israel is the only democracy in the Middle East when Israel does not allow half of the people in its territories to vote. And of course, we have this system in Puerto Rico where the Puerto Ricans basically can't vote. But because they have commonwealth or colonial status, they don't have to pay taxes and they get large subsidies. So the independence movement in Puerto Rico and the movement to become a 51st state, neither of them have beaten out the people who want to keep the status quo. Now, up until the murder of the two participants in the Oslo Peace Accords, Yitzhak Rabin, a war hero who was very conservative and hated by many on the left, but finally decided that for the future of his children and grandchildren, there should be peace with the Palestinians, and Yasser Arafat, whose character can best be described in the readings, in reading the writings of Israel peace activist Uri Avneri, not as bad a fellow as many might think, who was probably assassinated by Ariel Sharon. We shall likely know soon, because there's an autopsy going on. He was probably assassinated with polonium. It looked like peace in the Middle East might actually happen. But since Netanyahu was elected, it has been a bad situation. With the wall erect, erected, a giant massive steel wall along the, uh, not just the borders of Israel, but cutting into the West Bank to carve out protection for the settlements. <clears throat> With this, uh, 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 the Israelis win as long as the U.S. gives them unquestioned backing because they have a very strong ability to not uh, suffer casualties with this wall erected now and the ultra tight security that they have. And a, a friend of mine from Israel, my, my uh, brother in law through marriage, uh, 
described. The, the problem at the checkpoints isn't so much hostility, it's just uh, the usual dumb police types. The bottom of the barrel of the Israeli army gets assigned to man these checkpoints. So they're the dumbest, like the dumbest police types possible man the checkpoints. He, he disagrees with the idea that they're uh, savage, but that they're more just arrogant idiots. Um, and he described how they scanned his dictionary ten times to their scanner and didn't even notice he had a Quran with him, um, which was a funny story. <clears throat> now this policy um, is incredibly short-sighted, this Israeli uh, right-wing policy, because a fury is building in the hearts of many people, particularly Arabs and Muslims, but many, many people in the world, in the dehumanization of Palestinians by Israel. And I mean the fundamental issue is that they should have the right to vote. They have less rights than blacks in the north before the Civil War here in the United States. And in the meantime, what has happened to the progressives in Israel, willing to give the Palestinians pieces of Jordan and Egypt that Israel occupies, which would be the future Palestinian state, uh, what has happened to these progressives? One factor is that Israel has absorbed some less educated, more racist citizens from the former Soviet Union. People who my Israeli friends tell me think of Arabs as animals. Of course, this is a gross oversimplification, but Labour Party in Israel, which used to win elections, is now down to 17% in the last election. And uh, once uh, there's a new 20% of people who are voting in elections in Israel, and that 20% of the people who are voting in elections in Israel are these uh, more racist types that are less educated that are coming from Russia and the East Bloc after the fall of the Soviet Union. Um, the, the, the cream of the crop have gone to the West. Now, of course, I apologize for using such general stereotypes. I'm talking about macro uh, political issues. So to my Jewish brothers and sisters in the United States and around the world, I say, let us in America stop having to write a blank check for this insanity. Join J Street, the progressive Jewish organization seeking a two-state solution, and pressure the companies with prominent Jewish management to adopt a pro-two-state solution. During the racism, dump the racism of Netanyahu and all who stand with him. Now we in the U.S. have been turned into Israel ourselves with our airport security and war of and on terror. Our drone attacks breeding hatred by Arabs and Muslims, intellectuals and citizens of smaller countries generally. Another important issue lately is a call for the banning of the use of military-style weapons by American citizens. On the one hand, no other country has gun death levels like the U.S or gun ownership levels. There's one gun for every man, woman, and child in this country in private hands. On the other hand, the traditional argument has been a police state cannot take over completely if the population is armed. Our right to bear arms is to resist the possible rise of a military-style police state imposed on us. Well, little froggies, the pot has been warming, and we now have most of corporate fascism, except with a big consumerist happy face on it. It will turn to a snarl soon enough, though, if you try to put the people in power who benefit out of power. Just witness the brutality against protesters of many kinds, from the Occupy movement to the protests against the International Monetary Fund and the World Bank. And uh, now a law has been passed this last year, making certain forms of protest in illegal and was voted on nearly unanimously and had the oddest Orwellian name of something like a National Buildings Register Maintenance Bill. But it says if you get near a Secret Service person or a Congress person, you're committing a crime. Or if you even have been to a place they're going to visit. And I uh, will post that in the footnotes. So <clears throat> I take the concern that disarming the population is not all upside. I take that concern seriously. Our nation, since its dropping of the bomb on Hiroshima and Nagasaki, has become an ultimate violent nation. We have been the primary aggressor and intervener around the world. We have interfered in the affairs of dozens, if not a hundred, developing countries, fueling insurgencies by arming one or the other side, deposing left-wing elected presidents and installing right-wing military rule. Libya could even be seen as an aspect of this, deposing a leftist government and installing a rightist government. So I say we have an ultra-violent government, our military, our prisons, our unnecessary infliction of poverty on our population are all forms of state violence. 
So the second aspect of uh, the violence of our society is the celebration of this fascism by Hollywood, which is exacerbated by the WASP neocon pro-Israel, even when Israel is doing things that damage U.S. interests, such as screwing over the Palestinians massively, making Arabs hate us even more than when we are drone attacking and funding their despots and invading their country's uh, coalition. Hollywood this year produced two movies, Zero Dark Thirty and Argo. Both of them are advertisements for the Central Intelligence Agency. The CIA is not a good force in America. Two major, two major movies advertising for it in one year is disturbing. What is also disturbing is that Zero Dark Thirty implies torture is, in, is effective, when it probably isn't. This brings me to a funny story. There's a book that was uh, Terry Gross on Fresh Air on NPR interviewed the author of called God's Jury, the Inquisition and the Making of the Modern World. In the 1500s, the Spanish Inquisition only allowed one torture session per subject, although they had some ways of getting around that by considering it paused from day to day rather than a second session. And they only used three techniques. The rack, uh, which is where you're tied to a table and your legs and arms are pulled apart with pulleys and then uh, a rope where you're tied with your hands behind your back and lifted up into the air and then the rope is given some slack and you're dropped in. and then finally waterboarding. The Spanish Inquisition knew quite well that waterboarding was torture but apparently not the Bush administration. We also use this technique of tying people by the hands and lifting them up and dropping them. We use two of the three techniques of the Spanish Inquisition, and we didn't only conduct one session per uh, inquisitee. So Zero Dark Thirty, while perhaps a well-crafted propaganda film, or even a well-crafted film, is nonetheless a fla fatally flawed vision, and first failing to address any of the moral dimensions of these activities, which could certainly be done so without breaking the bleakness or starkness or realism of the film and even worse, distorts what happened to make it appear torture obtained actionable intelligence, where in fact that intelligence was not even obtained through torture. <clears throat> so they could have certainly edited that movie on the, on the cutting room floor uh, if they had chosen to. They went with a story that made torture seem plausible and justifiable by twisting reality, and uh, it is just sickening. And then in the case of Argo, the story of the century, perhaps, on Iran that occurred when the hostages were taken crisis was not that there was a fake Canadian film made by the CIA to sneak a few people out. No, it was written about a book by uh, the Iran specialist under Carter in the White House, who's also a member of the National Security Council at the time, Gary Sick. And this book was called October Surprise. And in this book, he did some investigation. It looks like I think it was Rumsfeld and Cheney both went to Paris to negotiate with the Iranians to make them keep Americans uh, imprisoned by the Iranian revolutionaries until after the election so that Reagan would win. And in fact, they were released five minutes after his presidency, his inauguration. And there's a lot of evidence. I'm not saying that it's 100% uh, certain, but it's funny. They, they would the one big movie that we made about the hostage crisis would not even mention something that when hostages were told this might be the case, they said it's just too overwhelming. I cannot deal with this. I cannot believe that my government would have kept me in that situation. So we had two of these propaganda films for the CIA this year. And the point is that Hollywood is part of the military-industrial media complex now, and it's part of the axis of American violence, the glorification of this war on terror of American militarism. So I would say to those who wish to regulate the ownership of guns in the United States to a greater extent, it is great you are concerned about violence and aggression. There are three facets. There's state violence, there's media sensationalization and propagandizing of violence, and then the third are murders committed in this country using guns. So I say lead by example. Cut military spending. Cut police spending. Free people in prison for nonviolent crimes. Free people in prison for victimless crimes. Lead by example.
and uh, then we can reciprocate by reducing assault rifles and banana clips. But let's see the government make the first move in de-escalating the violence in this world. So I would like to end with what you can do. What you can do to combat all of these sinister and depressing uh, events in the world. <clears throat> uh, so before we finish, I should just briefly uh, review with you what they are of recent date, in case you've been snoozing. Let's see if I can find this. All right. So you go to jail now for modifying one of your possessions that you bought. PBS makes a movie on drones, which is uh, sponsored by Lockheed Martin, um, targeting journalists. Um, the new cybersecurity unit of the Pentagon for internet censorship. Um, let's see if uh, this is very good. You should read this. This is about this. This is a good article from Yuri Avneri, if I can find it for you, right here, poisoning Arafat. The LAPD is now has devices that can capture your cell phone's transmissions to track you. Uh, fake cell stations that are in the in a briefcase, basically. Um, here's a fellow who's concerned about uh, internet censorship and has a very interesting story um, where he wants to encrypt half of the internet so that you aren't specifically called out if you. Um, are encrypting things because right now if you encrypt things the government thinks you have something to hide but if everybody was doing it then they would lose that. This is a very interesting article about the US Qatar Alliance um, and uh, hopefully you can google these things. I'll try to post them all. Um, so we'll just uh, stop there. I'll try to uh, post as many of these links as possible. So what can you do about it all? You can cancel your service with companies that are bad actors. Cancel your service with Comcast and AT&T and Verizon if you can. Use Skype over Wi-Fi for mobile devices whenever possible. Don't buy company from companies affiliated with the military-industrial complex. Don't vote for the Democratic or Republican parties unless your vote is in a swing state that can actually out, uh, affect the outcome of an election. Vote against incumbents. Vote for middle-class people, not the well-connected, whenever possible. Buy food from farmers. Don't go to large corporate stores. Install solar and wind and grow food in your own garden. Sabotage the large corporate economy by boycotting it. Of course, buy the things that you need, but think about it. Don't pay taxes to government sect, uh, uh, sectors that spend them on incarceration and spying and warfare. Instead, donate your money to good causes to reduce your taxes. Work less to reduce your taxes. Let the ultra-wealthy pay for their own wars and propaganda at the least, and not force you to pay for them. And I think that concludes tonight's broadcast. Thank you, good night, and good luck.